Hi, the last talk of the session, Kyla Crane and myself are going to give. First of all, I'm going to introduce Kyla while she's getting the talk geared up. Kyla is a pediatric dietitian and serves as the nutrition coordinator for the Georgia chapter of the American Academy of Pediatrics. In this role, she's uh, worked on a lot of nutrition initiatives, including serving as a liaison for the Georgia Women, Infants, and Children, or the WIC program. She's also staffs the Committee on Nutrition, helps with the Weight Task Force, and many other efforts. Uh, she's really an advocate for state efforts involved for nutrition and physical activity, including the Obesity Action Network, Georgia Shape, and Nutrition for Kids. Okay, our topic today is optimizing nutrition and formula selection for uh, toddlers and children. First, my name is Jay Hockman. I work as a pediatric gastroenterologist in town. One of my other roles is uh, chair of the Committee on Nutrition for the Georgia AAP. I um, actually don't speak a lot, so uh, uh, this, this stays an exception. I do blog a lot. I have a blog called Guts and Growth, which highlights a lot of studies in uh, primarily GI studies, but also nutrition and other factors. I don't have any re relevant financial disclosures, perhaps unfortunately. Um, I did borrow several slides from a, a GI and nutrition colleague, Dr. Praveen Gooday out of Wisconsin, and I do plan to talk briefly about an off-label use of the medication cyproheptadine. So our objectives today are to go over several common nutritional presentations. This is a very pragmatic talk. Uh, not nearly much of the, uh, uh, not nearly as much science, and not as many studies are reviewed. But hopefully, it'll be something very helpful that could be used in your practice. We're also going to highlight uh, some of the formula selection for toddlers and children, and briefly discuss uh, a WIC as well. So, first of all, just to review, you know, the expected growth. You know, basically, infants in the first year of life triple their weight, but they don't quadruple their weight until two, and from two until puberty. Uh, kids typically gain two to three kilograms per year, which is about three and a half to six and a half pounds. And the average height is typically five to eight centimeters per year during that period of time. So obviously knowing this data is real important if you're trying to figure out if kids are uh, growing well. Uh, parents have a number of concerns about nutrition, uh, but including limited variety of interests and food selection, distraction during eating, and of course, uh, particularly around Halloween, uh, desire for treats, uh, but it seems like that's probably a year-long phenomenon as well. So really when you see parents and children, this comes up a lot, but there's often talked about in nutrition circles a division of responsibility, where parents have certain roles such as providing good meals and defining when and where kids eat and trying to model good behaviors. Parent, children have a smaller role, but really our job isn't to force feed them. They really should be able to determine how much that they get to eat and participate in food choices. By 15 months of age, toddlers can do a lot. They can generally self-feed a lot of uh, table foods and use sippy cups. Um, and generally weaning from a bottle is recommended by 12 to 15 months of age. It becomes particularly important at night to avoid dental caries. And of course, in younger children in particular, avoiding choking hazards is standard advice, like nuts and popcorn, candy and carrots. <clears throat> when kids are being fed, avoiding distractions like TV is a good idea, and for toddlers being in a high chair. Um, one thing that a lot of parents don't recognize, and even a lot of healthcare providers don't recognize, is that a lot of children are labeled as being picky. They might try a food once or twice and not seem to accept it, and parents will say, oh, it's a picky child. But it's well known that it can take eight to ten offerings of a food before a child will love it. Um, picky eating tends to peak between 18 and 24 months of age, and so oftentimes you'll see parents come in with their two-year-old saying, I can't get this child to eat. Um, and also another concern is often vitamins. A lot of parents want their kids to take more vitamins because maybe that's going to make them to eat. Uh, it certainly doesn't make them eat more. Um, but if they are very food selective, it might be a good idea. Or if they have uh, underlying diseases like cystic fibrosis or inflammatory bowel disease. In kids that are definitely growing poorly, it's probably reasonable as well. One misconception parents have is that uh, juices and fruit drinks might actually be healthy for them. Um, and that's definitely not true. Uh, the AAP recommends four to six ounces of juice at maximum in kids in the first six years of life, and only eight to 12 ounces in seven to 18-year-olds. Um, but obviously, they're used a lot more commonly. 
Uh, some basic food books that often are recommended in our office for toddlers. Ellen Satter is a nutritionist and a psychologist, and she's got a bunch of books. Uh, actually, those who've read her books recognize that there's a lot of overlap from one book to another. Um, but Child of Mind deals a lot with the kids in the first five years of life in the first 80 pages or so on breastfeeding. Uh, Secrets of Feeding Healthy Family is pretty standard advice for everybody else. Dr. Laura Jana and Dr. Jennifer Chu have a book called Food Fights, which is also a pretty good resource for just general advice and such like that. I'm kind of running through the slides here a little bit to try to make sure we run on time. If anybody in the audience needs a copy of these slides, I'm happy to email them to you. Just come and see me afterwards and stuff. And we'll make them available. I don't know if this is on. We'll make them available, um, including all the slides from this morning. Perfect. So what I wanted to focus most of the talk on was a couple common presentations and work through some problems. Um, and so the first case I'm going to present is a 14-month-old who was born weighing only 2.2 kilograms, despite the fact he was born at term. He has tracked along steadily at the third percentile for both weight and height, uh, and his weight for length ratio is at the 25th percentile. So this is really a rhetorical question. I think instead of getting into this, I'll just go through what I would su suggest doing. So when we, we see a lot of kids referred to us who are small but actually well proportioned. And most of those kids actually don't have GI problems that we can tell. So of course, we'll try to ensure that they have adequate caloric intake. In our office, it's pretty easy to do. We have a couple nutritionists, so I might just say, here, complete this three-day food record. And our nutritionist will analyze it and say, oh yeah, he, this kid's eating fine or maybe he's not getting enough calcium or whatever, whatever it may be. Uh, it is probably a good idea anybody that sees a GI doctor for us to ask them specifically, are you having any symptoms? A lot of times kids will have problems unless you ask a specific question, you might not get the answer. A good example that we see every day is, for example, eosinophilic esophagitis. I'll see teenagers all the time and say, well, you know, uh, are you having any problems? They'll say no, but then you say, how long does it take you to eat? Do you have to drink a lot of water for food to get down? Is food getting stuck? And they'll say, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. That's always how, that's how it's been my whole life and everything. Um, of course, when we see kids that are well proportioned, we want to make sure that they have a normal exam. And then we may follow them and make sure that they continue to grow well. It's obviously helpful for a specialist to see growth patterns, because sometimes if we only see a snapshot in time, we may be underestimating the problem. If they're using WIC and they're small but well proportioned, usually a standard allotment is what we recommend. They don't need to be on any specialized formulas per se. This slide reviews <coughs> from a journal called Obesity uh, some data that indicates that if you're born very big or born very small, you tend to correct a lot in the first, well, six months of life, particularly the first four months of life. But if you don't correct in that period of time, you may always be on the big side or always be on the small side. I think a lot of neonatologists are taking this to heart too. They're trying to get kids not to actually get worse when they're in the natal, natal units, which sometimes happens. And they recognize they have an opportunity to try to get some of these small premature infants bigger. And if they're not successful, they, these kids might never be uh, a normal size. The second case I want to discuss is a patient who's born at uh, 36 weeks, also small, only weighing 4 pounds, birth length of 17 inches. Uh, OBs noted that growth was a problem throughout pregnancy, and the child was mildly dysmorphic, but there was no genetic problem that they could identify. This is a growth curve that we often see in our office. I'm seeing most of you have seen curves like this as well, where you see the weight is kind of slipping further away from the growth percentiles. And if you look at this curve, by the way, it is a World Health Organization curve. And generally, the WHO curves are recommended in the first two years of life. Um, those are the curves that we generally will rely on. Other growth data for this child, this child is still uh, getting longer appropriately. And it seems like for kids who are uh, not getting enough nutrition, most of the time the weight is affected much quicker than the height. Um, this is a proportionality curve, again, showing that the child, as he's getting older, is getting skinnier. So for this child who is actually not growing so well, you know, obviously the easy things, or so-called the low-hanging fruit, is to say, oh, we'll put them on a high-calorie diet, um, and maybe uh, high-calorie formula, uh, baby foods. And actually, there are a good number of kids who will respond to that. And maybe food insecurity, like uh, some of our previous speakers have been talking about, some kids 
if they get pediasure instead of water or juice or whatever, it's surprising that that sometimes can be such a good intervention or the other formulas as well that are high calorie that we'll mention later. Um, beyond offering a, a nutritious diet, we well, certainly tell parents that they should try to avoid having the child graze throughout the day. A lot of parents are just begging kids to eat because they didn't eat their dinner, so five or ten minutes later they're asking them to eat a little bit more. And in the long run, that's just shooting themselves in the foot. Uh, that's not what we recommend. If this child's not having GI symptoms, we still might do screening labs, and I'll go over that right now. So typically, if I see a child who's not growing well, these are the studies that I often would get. I'd look at some basic labs, looking for any anemia, looking at, uh, you know, obviously liver and renal function tests. Uh, celiac testing, as Dr. Lewis had mentioned earlier, usually in our practice we don't get panels. We typically will just screen with a TTG, IgA, and an IgA. One thing that's nice is, um, uh, uh, is that we actually have it set up as a panel. So basically, um, if the person is IgA deficient, it'll automatically flip into a TTG, IgG. So there is a panel both with Quest and uh, LabCorp that can do that. And uh, so that's helpful, because if someone has a low IgA, as they were saying, the, the TTG IG is not reliable. Although I will tell you, if they're not totally deficient, but only low, you know, again, there's a, a degree here, usually the TTG IgA is still pretty good if you're not deficient. So if someone has, let's say, an IgA of 30 and the cutoff is 40, the test will still probably be accurate 90% of the time. But generally speaking, if you have a low IgA or a deficient IgA, it's generally recommended to get a TTG IgG subsequently. But in our office, we don't typically order panels. Um, many times I'll order a fecal elastase, and elastase is a measure of pancreatic function. So if the child has cystic fibrosis or Schwachmann diamond or some other pancreatic insufficiency, this is a pretty good screen. Obviously, kids are screened at birth for cystic fibrosis, but occasionally it is missed, and this helps to reassure us that there's not a pancreatic insufficiency. Urinalysis is common. A lot of people will get a thyroid uh, stimulating hormone. If we have a child who's refusing to eat, then we have to think about whether they should get an endoscopy. We certainly see a number of kids who've got disorders like eosinophilic esophagitis who will not eat. Most of the kids who aren't eating, it's usually more behavioral, but it's certainly something we think about if we can't get, get a child to eat or they're choking with eating or things like that. Obviously, if there's any neurological problems, sometimes a swallow study, or if they're vomiting a lot, sometimes an upper GI to look for any um, narrowings or blockages. So really, what percent cross two growth percentiles in the first two years of age? This is a busy slide looking at both the WHO growth curves and the CDC at various ages. Um, but bottom line, it's about 23% of kids cross two or more growth percentiles in the first two years of life. This slide also looks at the length for age, and again, I'm going to curse over that. But the bottom line is there are a lot of people who will cross over curves. It doesn't necessarily mean um, that they're doing lousy. It does make us a little bit more nervous, and, uh, you know, one sign that a child's doing well is steady growth, and when they're not having that, we don't know if this is just a, uh, a normal uh, pattern at first until we follow them for a lo longer stretch. Um, again, with the small premature infant, a lot of them, if they don't catch up in the first few months of life, uh, may never catch up. About one in four, you know, uh, micro preemies stay um, below, the, um, below the curve, and so again, they're at higher risk for that. Uh, typically speaking, in our office, I don't use the term failure to thrive very much. A lot of people have talked about that. I typically talk about growth failure, but it's just a personal um, uh, preference. I think it's, you, you, there's no way you can get away from failure to thrive, though. It's on all the ICD-10s and other things like that, but nevertheless, I tend not to use that terminology. Practically, kids that are failure to thrive would be kids that have a weight for length less than the second percentile or possibly a BMI less than the third percentile on the CDC curve. Most people don't rely on BMIs in the first two years of life. Um, as we all know, when you're measuring a, a wiggly kid, the length is less reliable than the weight. And when you get a BMI, you are squaring the length. And so the BMI is going to be even more problematic than a weight for length as a measure of how well proportioned somebody is. Um, and sometimes repeat measurements are certainly a good idea. Something doesn't look right. Um, another definition for poor growth would be someone who's not growing for a while. Obviously, the younger they are, 
the shorter the period that we would find it acceptable. And the older they are, sometimes it takes a while to really make that assessment. If you're having significant downward trends in the weight percentiles, that's important. And as we talked about, 23% of kids will cross uh, two percentiles between birth and two years of age. Um, and in addition, I think it's worthwhile repeating, but it's obvious that if you've got two short parents, uh, they're more likely to have two short kids or, or such. For GI doctors, many times we try to figure out, is this my problem or somebody else's? If the kid's short and they're not skinny, many times that's an endocrine problem, although uh, there are exceptions like celiac disease and Crohn's disease can certainly result in poor linear growth. Um, but most of the time, if the child is short, but not skinny, uh, most of the time we're not going to do a big workup. Uh, it is a quick and easy exercise to calculate the midparental height, and that helps you determine how tall someone should be. And generally, eight and a half centimeters on either side of that can give you the two standard deviations. Obviously, subtracting two and a half inches for females and adding two and a half inches to that mean uh, for uh, males. And again, another factor that we all see all the time is constitutional delay and keeping that in mind in some kids who aren't growing as well as we would like. So sometimes a bone age can be very helpful in assessing that. The third case I'm going to review is a four-year-old boy. He's actually had poor weight gain for two years. His BMI is below the third percentile. He was not a small baby, but he is picky and an anxious eater. He's had normal screening labs. So what do we do at this point? Well, again, we may tell them to eliminate or decrease juices, and we'll tell people to go ahead and set them on a scheduled meal and scheduled snacks, you know, maybe every three hours or, you know, basically three, uh, three meals and two or three snacks a day, and typically limit meal times to no more than 20 to 30 minutes. Generally, no feeding outside of meal times. A lot of kids that are growing slowly, we want to make sure they're trying to consume a high-calorie diet, so they might take a high-calorie beverage. And this is one situation where many of us have tried uh, cyproheptidine or periactin. It does seem to help some kids with their appetite. And overall, it seems to be a fairly safe medicine. Although we do see some kids who get very cranky, and there's a good number of kids who won't stay on it because it's just not agreeing with them. Some kids need a G-tube to grow, and there's not an absolute formula like that they have to get a G-tube this point. It's partly a judgment call. And my guess is most pediatric GI doctors are less interested or less aggressive about putting in G-tubes than most pediatricians. Um, we see so many kids that are small, it's those that are really small stand out quite a bit. And you're always trying to make sure that the treatment isn't worse than the problem. So that's something we think about. All the things like adding cyperheptidine or adding more calories in the diet if you can, those are easy things. But putting in a G-tube, although it's not very difficult, it's still a much bigger decision than those. Some kids need additional workup before then, like an endoscopy. Um, sometimes if we're trying to figure out if someone's going to grow, sometimes we've put in a tube in the nose, a nasogastric tube or a nasojejunal tube, and see, does this make this child grow? And sometimes that's helpful to know if that's really going to work. Um, there's a product that's now available called the AMT Bridal, which allows you to make it less likely that the child will dislodge the tube. Um, a good website for tubes, all things tubes, is a website called Feeding Tube Awareness. Um, this is a parent-run website, and when you get to that website, there's a 24-page PDF in English and Spanish that explains even basic things like venting G-tubes and, and pictures of different tubes and such like that. There's also other things on there like products like G-tube belts so kids won't pull out their G-tubes and other supplies. <coughs> so that's certainly something that would be a good reference for parents and actually for most uh, doctors who don't do, deal with G-tubes all the time. The last case I'm going to present is a 19-month-old. Uh, again, the weight and height are just below the third percentile. This kid is breastfed and wants to breastfeed all the time. So what are recommendations for this kid? Um, Again, we get back to scheduled meals and snacks, but for kids that are at this age and feeding all the time, many people would recommend limiting breastfeeding, perhaps to twice a day or perhaps uh, stopping altogether. Um, again, sitting in a high chair for toddlers and offering her small amounts of milk in an open cup. Uh, generally, nothing but water in between meals and limiting meal times to 20 to 30 minutes. Uh, no juice, and this might be another kid where we might say it might not be such a bad idea to use a multivitamin. Um, so we see, again, a lot of reasons for feeding problems. 
Uh, a lot of kids with feeding problems have underlying anxiety. Some have autism. And certainly, uh, if they're very food selective, but they're growing, sometimes you're going to be dealing with some other factors before dealing with the nutrition. But sometimes you're dealing with uh, you know, behavioral issues and nutrition at the same time. There are some kids who gradually become very, very food selective. They'll eat this chicken nugget, but not that chicken nugget. And that chicken nugget was fine last week, but somehow this week it's not fine. There are some people who've taken that approach and saying, well, I'm just going to go back and offer something that this child was clearly tolerating a few weeks ago and saying that that's the food for today. You know, this child's not going to get dehydrated in a day if they're not having vomiting or diarrhea. Although I think with very unusual kids, involvement of a feeding uh, psychologist along with an experienced nutritionist is generally recommended. I'm going to transition now to uh, Kyla, who's going to talk a lot more about some of the formulas and also WIC. Thank you, Dr. Hoffman. Can everyone hear me? So I'm just going to briefly um, speak of the Georgia WIC program and some of the formulas that they provide. We do have um, some guests here in the audience here. Um, Denise and Caroline, if you could stand up, please. Sorry, I didn't tell you this beforehand. <laughs> we have Denise Vance and Caroline Powers from the Georgia WIC program. They have an exhibit in here. so. Please visit them during our breaks at the exhibit hall. If you have any specific questions about what's WIC approved and medical documentation, they'll be able to give you more specifics, whereas I'm just going to highlight a, a few brief items. So as far as formulas, um, to be clear, that we have no preference here, no bias. We want to be able to share some information from all the different companies. For poor weight gain, um, when you're looking at what's WIC approved, um, there's Boost Complete Pediatric, uh, Pediasure, Neutron Junior. Those are often used for poor weight gain. Um, we talked about for halal or for your kosher um, selection that if you contact your formula companies, they often have certificates for which ones are considered halal or which ones are kosher. Typically, it's often the soy products. Um, you may be familiar, certain enzymes may use pork or brewer's yeast and some of the nucleotides that, that make it non-halal or, or kosher. So usually you want to stick with your soy products for, for those instances. For multiple food allergies, um, you have your amino based in your dipeptides, Elocare, Neocate, Pure Amino. You also have Pediasure Peptide, Peptamin Junior. I'm sure you guys are familiar with all of these products. Um, here, I know with Dr. Hockman, this is a rule of thumb that you often use. Yeah, this, this is just real briefly for some YouTube dependent kids. A, a lot of times, a, a quick rule of thumb is if they're on a, using a form of through a G-tube. Usually, if kids are less than 10 and they're getting four cans a day, they're meeting their micronutrient and uh, protein needs. And if they're older than 10, six cans is a good rule of thumb. A lot of times in kids that are G-tube fed, some of them have low calorie needs. So some of the formulas that are low caloric density are actually very helpful rather than just diluting the formulas. Sure. And then here we have some that, or we have two. One is, is Georgia Wick approved, the other isn't. The complete reduced calorie is approved, and Pediasure Sidekicks, as of now, is not currently WIC approved. Um, also, there is massive amount of subspecialty sections, whether it's your genetic, metabolic formulas, renal, liver. Have, has, raise your hand if you've ever been to the Georgia WIC website. Okay, so here you can find a five-page Georgia WIC approved formulary five page for everything, and this is updated quarterly, I believe. You can take a look at that. So this is one of the great resources they have on there. In addition to that, they also have your medical documentation form, which I'm sure you're familiar with as well. This year, we're working closely with the Georgia WIC program uh, with Dr. Cohen and Dr. Hockman on a couple of items. We're working on creating a policy of toddler formulas. So what criteria, what type of um, circumstances can we come up with to help them approve formulas for toddlers, your higher calorie formulas? So we're working to develop a group to, to develop a policy to help the Georgia WIC program on that. In addition to the infant formula algorithm that you may be familiar with, 
We did this in 2012, Dr. Cohen did this, and it has the algorithm for a healthy infant on Georgia WIC, and it takes into account common conditions that you see, and then it helps guide you through what is the formula that is recommended. In addition to that, we also created a resource guide that lists the specific formulas. So we are in the process of updating this to include some of the new formulas that are on WIC and change um, some of the product sizes and put the new ICD-10 on here. So you'll be getting that information shortly. In addition to the creation of a toddler formula algorithm um, that looks at the nutritionals that are approved through Georgia WIC, that we're working closely with Dr. Hockman and Dr. Cohen on that. In addition to that, um, we will be doing some trainings on um, different um, nutrition-related items for the WIC nutritionists. So um, I may be coming to some of you for resources for that, or if you'd like to present. Uh, we're always looking for presenters in these instances. So right now, you may be familiar with the Georgia WIC contract is currently with Nestle Gerber. We are in the second year of the Nestle contract. So it's a three-year contract, and then there is the potential to have a two-year extension on the end. So what that means is this could be the current contract up until 2018, um, if it does go into a two-year extension beyond the third year. These particular formulas are the ones that you do not have to provide any medical documentation for. I mentioned the medical documentation form. This form is found on the WIC website, which I'll show you in just a second. But it is a two-pager, and I have been in lots of practices where we just copy the front and the back does not get photocopied. So please make sure you see the back. The back is important. It, it gives you some indications of which particular diagnoses are, or diagnoses are approved, and it also gives you the infant formula maximum for infants. So when you have to enter in how many ounces, this guide will let you know of the, the maximum amount they qualify for for that particular age. So please make sure you have the back if you've never seen it. So here is the list for the five-page formulary for the, for the five-page list of all WIC-approved formulas for Georgia WIC. I'm so used to saying WIC.GA.gov. That used to be the old URL, but I think if you put that in, it still takes you to this dph.georgia.gov website. Medical documentation, I know you might have specific questions when it comes to that. And again, we have them here in the exhibit hall if you have any questions for that. But the medical documentation rules come from the U.S. Department of Agriculture. So USDA has implemented this rule for necessity of need for formulas. So you do have to show that when you are prescribing a WIC formula that there is a indeed medical need for, for having it. Also, with the MDF form, it not only allows you to prescribe infant or toddler formulas, but also WIC foods. When they changed the food package in 2009, it allowed you as the medical home to be able to also put on there whether they may have an allergy to peanuts, if they have cow's milk protein allergy, you can go in there and say they can't have other items or foods or milk because of the cow's milk in addition to formulas for those particular conditions. Also, it makes sure that you list all of the requirements on that form that you may need. So to, to turn in your medical documentation form, it would require the diagnosis, the ICD-10, the duration of use, the name of the formula, and the signature of the prescribing authority. Georgia WIC encourages the use of this medical documentation form. Um, you may remember you could have used your prescription form in the past, and you still can, but all of this information must be on it. So to make sure you are having all that information, it is encouraged to use this form. Uh, so I, I was hoping we might have more time, or this is really a filler slide in case we have lots of time, but I wrote this slide actually just to say that there are a couple really big stories in nutrition for this past year, and these are some of the studies. Uh, but just short briefly, there's the LEAP study that seemed to show, well, did show that early introduction of peanuts lowers the risk of peanut allergies. Uh, and um, there's also a study on something called the low FODMAPs diet. This has been done in pediatrics, but also in adults. It's showing that this diet can be effective for irritable bowel. As Dr. Cohen alluded to, there was a study that compared 
Enteral Nutrition to Remicade uh, that was published this year that showed that enteral nutrition can be very effective. A pretty recent study showed that curcumin, a spice, can be very effective for ulcerative colitis. And another thing that's another story that came out this year is there's a changing practice with acute pancreatitis. People are tending now to start feeding kids earlier with acute pancreatitis, and that's true in adults as well. So those were the studies. Um, and so for reference, we include them on this talk as well. Um, in conclusion, this talk, I tried to show that if you have a child that's growing steady but small, avoiding overly aggressive nutrition intervention is probably appropriate. If the child has poor growth, the workup is actually fairly limited. The most common reasons are still not eating enough, uh, or occasionally that the child's just meant to be small. And as Kyla pointed out, there's a lot of different formulas available, and just understanding what's available and when to use it is certainly a good idea. Uh, at this point, I'm going to ask Dr. Cohen to come up. We have just a few minutes for questions, and uh, then we'll adjourn. I understand that in Israel there is a teething uh, food for toddlers for, with peanut. It hasn't made it to this country yet, and the incidence of atopic dermatitis is very low, et cetera, et cetera. You all go on about the peanut. G give me an uh, easy introduction to peanut to mom, uh, or maybe the dietitian. Sometimes they ask me, dog, I want to start early, a year old, teething. Well, I think uh, what you're getting at is really what the LEAP study looked at. There, that was a pretty selected population of kids that are actually increased risk for allergy. Um, and they actually tested kids ahead of time to check and see if they had a big reaction, like skin tests. They had a very big reaction. They didn't include them in the study. But I think if you're looking at all kids, it suggests that if they're not, particularly if they're not at high risk, that it may not be necessary to test them before just getting them a peanuts. The LEAP study that's on that reference, you can look at that. Also, if you look this up, like the New England Journal has their own blog that explains the study with expert reviews by uh, people like Dr. Sampson and such like that. And I think the message is clear. And it's also clear with things like wheat and celiac disease that the idea is that if you hold foods back longer, that you're going to decrease the risk is, is a fallacy. In fact, it appears to be just the opposite. So early exposure to foods seems to be generally beneficial. I would say with the LEAP study in particular, though, again, it was a selected population. I think the findings are still important, but whether or not some people might need to see an allergist beforehand if they're at very high risk is something that's not entirely clear to me. Stan, do you want to comment? The other thing that I think is an important aspect of that as well is the fact of introducing the feedings, particularly if, if the mother's still breastfeeding. Uh, Introduction of foods early on while breastfeeding seems to be even more protective and less than the potential for allergy as well. Um, that's an excellent question. So, uh, it, so first of all, it depends on a couple of situations. When we see kids, let's say I see a typical teenager is coming in and they might have some irritable bowel type symptoms or basically what a lot of people call functional pain. I do think that probiotics are one of a half dozen things that people often try. and I. I think whether or not they're effective is not clear, but there is a pretty high placebo rate with a lot of uh, functional disorders, and particularly since, placebo, since probiotics, by and large, even though they're not well regulated, most of them are very safe. So I would say it is one of the things I think it's very reasonable to try. It depends on where your pain is and what your symptoms are, but there are some, uh, some uh, teenagers with functional pains in particular that we'll use. I tend to not use probiotics as much in younger kids. I think when you look, if they're on antibiotics, sure, it might be a good idea. But there's a pretty high number to treat in order to see one kid that benefits. And I think that people have an um, overestimation about how effective those agents are. You know, Dr. Lewis spoke a little bit about uh, 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 an organization called Open Biome. And actually, it's very interesting. On their website, they've got like a two-minute video that explains like fecal transplant. And you recognize when you look at the trillions of bacteria in our GI tract, how, you know, basically a lot of probiotics are spitting at the problem. You've got tiny amounts of bacteria compared to what you're trying to influence. So it's not surprising that oftentimes they're not effective. But do we use them for stomach pain? Sure. But uh, it's not necessarily the top of my list, and it's certainly uh, one of many things that we might use.
Would you, uh, do you want to comment further? Um, I, I have a little bit of a difficulty with probiotics in terms of that. Um, just because it's the same as an antibiotic. What do you do? Um, tell somebody who's got a, um, an ear infection, oh, I'm just going to put you on antibiotics, but I, I'm, it doesn't matter which one. I'm just going to throw you on an antibiotic. Probiotics are, are more specific than that. And in fact, some of them tend to be more constipating. Some of them tend to be less constipating, and in fact, towards looser stools. And it, it also depends on the shelf life, the number of bacteria, and what's there. So I think it, it's going to get a little bit more refined than it is right now. Um, there are a number that have been tested. I think that they're clearly indicated after an infection and you've wiped out their intestinal tract as well as their ear infection when you've given them an antibiotic for their ear infections. How long do you use them? Well, I think you need them for several weeks. Do I think that they work in um, irritable bowel or functional abdominal pain? There are some studies that look at, at some of the uh, probiotics and they're useful, particularly those that are lactobacilli, lactobacilli and those that are um, uh, multiple organisms uh, in there as well. But you want to catch it early in the shelf life, not late in the shelf life, because the, their function is basically gone. And so there's a lot more to be said about it than just uh, um, probiotics. One of the other things that I often tell parents, again, as I was stressing with, when Dr. Kleinman was speaking, is that prebiotics are what you want to have to keep them going. So that some of that is, um, again, high fiber foods and vegetables that will help them to, to continue to be established.